Good afternoon. I'm Jim Duff, the Executive Director of the Supreme Court Historical Society, and it's my honor today to welcome you to the Society's virtual lecture platform. While the Supreme Court building remains closed to the public, the Society has pivoted to a series of lectures and discussions over Zoom. We do look uh, forward to returning to the uh, in-person programming in the court uh, one of these days when we're able but we also plan to continue these virtual lectures as well. It's been a bright light during the pandemic to be able to connect our programs to members who might not otherwise be able to travel to Washington to attend in person. And today's program is timed over the lunch hour for our West Coast friends. So we're happy to accommodate that and we welcome all of you who are joining us. Today's program is a conversation with Professor Mary Sarah Builder. Professor Builder is the Founders Professor of Law at Boston College uh, Law School. Her book, Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention, received the 2016 Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy, and was a finalist for the 2016 George Washington Book Prize. Her recent scholarship was focused on the age of the Constitution and the framing generation. Also transatlantic feminism, James Madison and the convention record, uh, and colonial and founding era constitutionalism, as well as Robert Morris, the early African-American civil rights activist and lawyer. She has taught at Boston College since 1994 and as a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and Columbia Law School. I'm going to start uh, with some conversation and questions with Professor Builder and then we will take questions uh, from the audience. And we ask you to please submit your questions in advance in the Q&A window of Zoom. We'll get to as many of those as we can. We're going to have a conversation today with Professor Builder about her book called Female Genius, and we're going to advertise that. Uh, and at the end, I'll hold up a copy of it, um, and we sell it in our uh, gift shop and uh, at the Supreme Court, and it's on, available online, which I'll give you the link to uh, at the end of our conversation. Professor Builder, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, thank you for inviting me. I'll begin with uh, uh, noting that you describe yourself in the book as not an originalist, but a uh, constitutionalist. And uh, what, uh, what do you mean by that? You explain it well in the book. Wow, that's like getting right to the heart of um, a, a controversial matter. Um, I, don't, I don't see myself as an originalist, and I've, I've, I've written kind of uh, extensively about this. I've really come to believe that the Constitution was an emerging genre. That's what's so exciting about it in this period. And that, um, that in some ways, the Constitution was still understood in its older understanding as a system of government. And that one of the extraordinary aspects of this sort of framing generation is the way that uh, the Constitution begins to be seen, not not even probably quite the way we see it, but um, in, in this new interesting way. And one of the reasons that I like thinking about the Constitution as a system of government is that it allows us to expand our understanding of who influences that system of government. It gives us a sort of uh, bigger space to have a conversation. And so I, I tend to think about the Constitution as a system of government um, created by a framing generation. And that helps us kind of move outside of, um, you know, our sort of traditional depiction of the people mattering being the people who are in the room who we know are um, all white men, property owners, and, you know, politically a rather elite group of people. And so I, I kind of like that. Um, I kind of like that framing. I spent a lot of time thinking about the Constitution. And that's, um, that's sort of where I am. And also for me, um, you know, I come to this uh, not as a um, constitutional uh, litigator, um, not even as a law professor who writes about current cases, but really um, as someone who thinks that the really interesting thing about this period is the way that the history understand helps us understand um, uh, sort of the aspirations of the period and some of the legacies we continue to live with today. 
Well, your, your book uh, sheds uh, new light uh, on uh, uh, matters that uh, arose around the framing of the Constitution, and uh, we're very grateful for your work on that. It's called, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, Female Genius. That was a, a new idea in the 1780s and 1790s. Uh, can you uh, tell our audience what, what are the origins of that phrase? And why was the descriptor female uh, necessary? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I think back now to the moment where I sort of was like, oh, wait, that should be the title of the book. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a phrase that I use that you see in contemporary um, literature in the 1770s and 1780s, uh, really describing women. And it's a it's a great concept because um, the book argues that this was a moment when uh, people, particularly women, imagined that they had the opportunity to sort of um, recast a classic assumption about women that they were in some ways inferior and therefore could not participate in um, the constitutional state um, uh, by holding office or, or by participating in the suffrage and could not participate in the same kinds of educational opportunities. And so what we see in this period, really, be, really beginning in the 1770s and then expanding into the 1780s, is um, people describing women as female geniuses. And what they mean by this is not what we might completely mean. Genius doesn't yet quite have its romantic um, sort of capacity notion of being a unique person. It's really referencing um, what we would think of as capacity. And so um, what we start to see is the word female attached to genius, which tended to be associated with men as a way of arguing that uh, that women were equal and that therefore they deserved to be able to participate. And, and in this period, what's really interesting is in um, education and in uh, Poli uh, sort of politics. And I first came to this recognition, really, and then, of course, the minute I saw it, I started seeing um, it anywhere in the book. It's, the book's peppered with descriptions of female geniuses uh, in, in those quotations. But there is a woman um, who writes a poem called The Female Advocate in the 1770s, and she names contemporary female geniuses. And one of them is Phyllis Wheatley, the great um, uh, American poet, African-American poet who had recently been uh, in London. And, and the moment you sort of see Phyllis Wheatley described as a female genius, the significance um, uh, of that phrase became really obvious. And then you see it um, uh, positively used by, by people trying to advocate for female genius. And then I have a um, wonderful translation by uh, Rousseau, where he describes you would not want uh, your daughters to be a female genius scribbling um, and reading pamphlets. So we see it sort of used in both respects in this period. Who was Eliza Harriet? And, uh, and how did you learn about her? And I have many questions follow up questions on this one, but we'll kick it off with that one. <laughs> yeah, so the book really began, I was I was working on my, um, during the period that I wrote my, my earlier book on James Madison's notes of the convention, I at one point read every extant diary that exists of the summer of 1787. And um, probably the ones people are familiar with are, you know, there's various note takers who take notes of the convention. But George Washington kept a really interesting diary, all of his activities outside of the convention. And, uh, and in that diary, um, he described going at the very beginning, he's at the beginning of the convention, you know, the Virginians showed up on time, the Pennsylvania delegates were there. Um, they can't start on time because none of the other delegations have shown up. And Washington's waiting. And while he's waiting um, on May 18th, he describes going to hear um, a lady lecture at the college hall. And in the fall, he goes back to Mount Vernon and he rewrites that entry. He rewrote his whole diary because he had forgotten his regular diary um, uh, in the summer. And he adds to that description and he describes her actually as a Mrs. O'Connell, uh, which wasn't her name. Uh, and he says she was um, sort of economically needed the money. Um, and then he describes her lecture as as tolerable. And so you know, this stuck in my head, kind of like, who, like, who is that lady? I, honestly, I didn't know if she was highly unusual or, um, or not. I thought I might just never have learned about anybody lecturing. Um, and, 
and that word tolerable of uh, people who are Jane Austen fans may know that um, that's what Mr. Darcy calls Eliza Bennet. Uh, and so tolerable has a has a meaning that um, is somewhat accepting. Uh, in certain ways, it has a slightly different meaning than we think of today. And so that was Eliza Harriet. That's how I came to her. And then uh, after I finished my Madison book, I started working on this project about her. Uh, and she's just a remarkable, uh, remarkable person, uh, born in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, marries an Irish Catholic lawyer in 1776 in London. They spend time in London and Dublin and then come to the United States. And in the United States, she's a very ambitious um, female educator. And right now, probably the first woman to give uh, significant public lectures uh, in Philadelphia, she gives them um, in, at what's now the University of Pennsylvania. You, you use the uh the phrase uh, that Washington described in his diary uh, is tolerable and, and uh, um, you have suggested it may have a slightly different meaning then than it does now. Now it would not be viewed as great praise, but uh, um, did, did you find examples or are there examples of what Washington might have found intolerable uh, by yeah. contrast? I mean, how, to try to put it in perspective, what his reaction to her lecture was, and then we'll talk, obviously, a lot more about her lectures and, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think what's so interesting to me um, uh, about this, and, and, you know, for people who are really interested in Washington, it's actually, um, you know, you can, you could sort of expand about it. There's a lovely excerpt that the Mount Vernon magazine did um, uh, from the book in this, in the spring issue. Um, you know, this is an interesting aspect of Washington for somebody who was not formally educated and he wasn't formally educated, um, uh, you know, in, in Europe or any of those places. Um, he, he actually, in some ways, was quite um, interested and expansive in his, in, in sort of what he was interested in. Uh, and, um, and he has actually a small, he has a school in uh, Alexandria that he sponsors and they write him, uh, you know, you sponsor, you, you offer to fund the school and everything. And we're wondering, uh, we'd like to admit women. And he says, uh, wow, that hadn't really occurred to me, but I suppose you could have um, women at the rate of one woman for every sort of four guys. Okay. And so that gives you a sense of, you know, he's, 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 He's willing to accept this. He's not going to be as accepting of it um, as perhaps some other people at the time are. But but for me, um, the work Washington does in this book is he shows that there's a possibility that this is a moment of contingency where um, some people who we might have assumed were very closed off to that possibility uh, actually find it interesting uh, and 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 open their minds to it. And Washington at the end of the summer of 1787 actually buys to take back to Mount Vernon three books that are all inspired by um, her lectures. One, a collection of poems that um, that was James Thompson, one of the um, sort of poets that she read. Uh, one, The Art of Speaking by James Burr, which is actually what she was advocating people doing. Uh, and one, a book of geography, which is the kind of um, uh, one of the sciences that she includes in her teaching. So he's he's obviously influenced her uh, by her in a, in a pretty deep, um, deep way. Interesting. And do, do you think his mere attendance at the lectures uh, sent sig positive signals? About, yeah, uh, yeah, it was enormously, uh, she probably delays her lecture in order for Washington to be able to attend because the lecture was actually originally supposed to be Thursday night and she delays it to Friday night. Uh, mm -hmm. He attends with Mrs. Morris, who, uh, Mary White Morris, who is the wife of um, Delegate um, Robert Morris and, and who Washington was staying at their house. And uh, and she's very sophisticated, Eliza Harriet. Um, that's her sort of first and middle name. It's what what she called herself um, at understanding Washington's power to amplify her message. So this is an aspect of who she is and her family that make her probably um, almost maybe more sophisticated than some women who had grown up in the United States. Her uh, father and uncle were respectively the governors of New York and New Jersey for a short period of time. And she go, grows up in a very ambitious admiralty family with an uncle who, who actually is an admiral. And so she understands the way that political power and political um, patronage can sort of 
um, amplify or expand your message. And she's very sophisticated about this. Uh, after Washington comes to her lecture, um, her lecture is obviously then covered in the newspaper. She actually probably writes most of the correspondence about the lady lecturing herself and sends it into the newspaper. But then all uh, many newspapers across the United States pick that up because Washington, you know, other than Franklin, Washington's probably the only figure with that kind of national uh, valence and and selling power. And she um, and she then praises herself as an anonymous correspondence in describing Washington's attendance, and uh, she gets quite a lot of mileage out of it. There's a um, there's a number of articles describing her lecture that she or her husband probably wrote about her lecture, all of which reference Washington and can be found in multiple articles. So um, she she really understands uh, his power to to cast sort of positive lights on her own activities. Your, your your work is very detailed, and it's obvious you went uh, to great lengths uh, in your research. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that process uh, and, and how you went about it um, before we get into more uh, of the substance of her lectures and, and, uh, and their, their impact and import? Yeah, so she's a person, there's only one person who's she's a she's a she shows up occasionally you know as i mentioned here and there um granville ganter wrote a, a wonderful article on her as as part of entrepreneurial female lecturing uh, she's included in that but other than that she kind of vanished um uh she was probably pretty well known um by reputation in the 1780s into the 1790s um but she has no children and she dies pretty impoverished, uh, and so she has no papers. And there's only five letters of hers, four of which were to George Washington, one to Benjamin Franklin's daughter. So, so we see her briefly through there. What I was really fortunate to be able to do, and this really is part of the importance of these digital, uh, the digital access we can get to newspapers now, particularly the very important um, American Antiquarian Society collections, is you can actually recover her newspaper ads. And you can sh and you can kind of find enough of them across that you can begin to understand the scope of um, of coverage. And so I was I was able to find over 150 advertisements uh, or notices about her in the Philadelphia papers for the summer of 1787, wow. and um, over 300 um, across the country relating to her activities. And you just you you could not have done this in a world before you had. Um, digitized newspaper access. Now that's not so easy. If your name's O'Connor, there turns out to be a lot of O'Connors. Um, <laughs> newspaper um, databases don't search very well for the O apostrophe. Uh, and, um, you know, the long S, the way the S in this period still looks like an F. You know, there's lots of problems with it. But, um, but I read a lot of newspapers. Uh, and I did a lot of searching and you can sort of reconstruct um, this very expansive um, advertising campaign that she had across the across the early American states. How, how did she come in contact with George Washington? I mean, how was it that he attended? You mentioned that the opening of the convention was delayed, and and so uh, would he have attended otherwise? Do you think, or was he looking for things to do? Or was he aware that this was coming and wanted to attend? What fill us a little bit of the background on that and, and how it was that he uh, attended the lecture. Yeah, so she was giving lectures in Philadelphia. They they moved to Philadelphia in April of 1787. Her She and her husband had um, uh, left um, uh, Dublin and London and come to the United States in 1786. And she starts in New York, um, running a very ambitious girls school in New York, which she starts on a kind of um, British model. It's actually successful enough that she gives her final exams at Columbia College and ask, and has the Columbia College faculty um, help. And then her husband moves um, to Philadelphia because New York is, of course, the capital of the United of the United States in this period, but all attention turns to Philadelphia um, for the uh, for the what we what we call the Constitutional Convention. And her husband goes to Philadelphia to actually um, be a short term. He it will turn out to be a short term edi editorial position uh, with one of the magazines. And she follows. This is a, a constant problem for her during her lifetime, which is her husband's always got a new idea, and they're either fleeing debts 
or following his ideas and she has to sort of reset up and she's the primary breadwinner um, for them. And in, in Philadelphia in um, April, she starts giving, uh, advertising a course of lectures by a lady. Uh, very shortly after that, she adds at the university and she had been giving lectures in April um, prior to the convention starting um, and Washington, you know, Mary White Morris and Washington describes going with Mary White Morris and some of her female friends um, to this lecture and uh, Washington, this is not, this is not so much in the book, but Washington actually spent a lot of his um, summer hanging with women. He he um, he liked the, the kind of conversation. He hangs with a group of women who we would think of as um, a sort of salon leaders and interested um, in politics, um, including Elizabeth Willing Powell, um, uh, the woman who famously asks, you know, Franklin, um, "What kind of government have you given us?" and 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 Franklin says, um, "It's a Republican." if you can keep it. And that's Elizabeth William Powell. And that's one of Washington's dear friends um, in the summer. So it's not, it's, um, you know, I, my own guess is he would have gotten there anyway, because he, he sort of was, um, re, you know, he was really interested in seeing what there was to do in Philadelphia. And, uh, and he, and he spent a lot of time with the Morrises. You mentioned uh, she advertised later uh, that he, he had attended her lectures. Were there other ways that she capitalized on uh, her, th this connection to George Washington? Yeah, so she, um, uh, she, she, uh, during during that summer, she actually publishes. She's very interested. She's a sort of early adopter of uh, expanding the works of Sir William Jones, who's going to be a very important person. He's actually a political reformer and and jurist in um, in England, and she uh, publishes his poetry re, kind of rewritten in Washington's honor in the in the poem uh, in the papers and that goes kind of viral in its own interesting ways and again all tied into the lady lecturing at the university so she um, expands that way she will eventually um, end up in Alexandria uh, where she sets up a school um, Washington declines to be explicitly on the board but seems to support her and then um, she will be in Charleston during Washington's Southern tour. And he, you know, my own guess is, although there's no evidence of that, that, um, that she tried to meet him again uh, at that point in her life. And so the, the two of them in interesting ways sort of continue to intersect through the 1780s and 1790s. Part of the book I, can be framed, I think, as expanding the story of the Constitutional Convention beyond the men inside Independence Hall. Can you uh, expand a little bit more on that and talk about the way Eliza Harriet does this and what she has achieved in, in yeah. doing this? Yeah. So one of the big, the sort of the big argument in the book is to um, is to really show how in the 17s and 1770s and 1780s we can we can see all these ways in which women. You know, not all women, but a very um, uh, a sort of important, influential group of women uh, transatlantically uh, in England, in Ireland, in France, um, and then in the United States, were pushing to imagine being included in politics. And and we forget sometimes that this is a world where um, prior to the 1780s, the things that kept people from participating in politics were actually property qualifications and religious qualifications. So that was the big um, uh, powerful uh, aspect of who could not participate in politics. And it's actually in the 1770s that we can find the first person of African heritage voting in, uh, in London because he met the property and religious qualifications. And um, in this period, like a really great example of this that people don't always know about is there's a number of women's debating societies. They're called things like the female parliament. And they actually explicitly debate and advertise in the paper debating the inclusion of women in higher education, in voting, and in um, politics. And there was a speech given, the book talks about by a young Princeton grad in 1783, uh, Washington was there also sort of arguing for women's inclusion in education uh, and politics. And so I argue she represents this kind of ambition, this moment when who's going to participate in the constitutional state actually turns out to be somewhat open. And, and her presence in Philadelphia matters. I argue that um, that she the, the 
the Constitution, um, the drafts of the Constitution include language that is um, possible, you know, gender explicitly male, and all of those references disappear. So the Constitution becomes gender neutral in 18th century terms, and it uses a very consistent person he designation to, to show that. And we know that because otherwise the interstate, I mean, I can say this here without having to explain it, uh, the interstate rendition clause wouldn't apply to people like me and we could commit all sorts of crimes and never be hauled back across state lines because that person, he appears there. And so in that sense, the constitution is um, very importantly gender neutral at a moment when uh, state constitutions are beginning to swivel on this. And mm. the gender neutrality of the constitution matters because we know women vote in this period. Persons of color also vote in this period. And we see that in New Jersey. New Jersey had a gender neutral constitution. Uh, it explicitly um, is understood to include um, women and people of color and women and people of color vote um, until they're disenfranchised in 1807. And so there's a space here that is contingent, that is open, where we're still trying to think about what does this new type of thing called a constitution do? That story is going to shift, but she helps us see how there's a, a, a sort of fluidity in this period and openness that might surprise us. Does she do that uh, explicitly, Professor Builder? Is it, or is it um more nuanced than that and oh I yeah i would i would like i would win a nobel prize if i could prove you know hey <laughs> governor morris scratch out that line uh, yeah no it's a it's a it's an argument that it's an argument there's there's no evidence about it it's an argument yeah. about the the way in which once we understand the power of this movement which yeah. you know the yeah. book has millions of examples of we can now re-understand some of these changes in the constitution as being open to it. I mean, it could be that nobody was thinking about it, but I don't think well, so. The fact that the constitution becomes gender neutral seems to me to be incredibly important. Well, I think one of the things that I encourage the readers uh, to, to, to get your book, and because you, you expand on this quite well, I think, in, in the work, the topics that she covers in her lectures and that's why I asked the previous question, is it explicit or is it more nuanced than that? The topics in her lectures are language, eloquence, poetry, taste, and criticism. I think I got those right. Yeah, you got uh, that. You were perfect. <laughs> um, and so you see those topics and you think constitutional convention and where's the fit, where's the influence, but it's a broader uh, impact than the explicit language, perhaps, in, in those lectures. Could you uh, expand on that? Yeah, concept? she rep she represents um, uh, in terms of the sort of um, intellectual influences that she cares about. She represents a, a whole uh, transatlantic idea about what mattered to we, we might think in this audience to participate as a um, participant, as a lawyer, as a politician. And so she she's this is a this is a really amazing moment where rhetoric and oratory has come uh, sort of been rediscovered. You know, obviously the Romans did that, right? But this is um, this is really where, where people turn to the power of speaking, to the importance of um, uh, being a good orator, uh, and the power of that in particular for um, certain professions. And so politics and law, also, also the church, but politics and law are two of those three um, places. And she's very influenced by uh, by very influential um, writers out of Ireland, out of Dublin, the Sheridans, who mm -hmm. really explain and publish books on uh, how you could learn to do this by watching good examples. And that's what she's providing. And what, so what's important in some ways about what she's doing is she's um, uh, placing a female at the center of the example of what it looks like to learn to speak well, which is which is becoming an important part um, of uh, law and uh, politics, and we see this, we see this um, this sort of constellation of politics, law, and speaking in a whole lot of other places. Right, it becomes very importantly, and she actually remarkably that summer one of the. Um, uh, 
speeches that she gives at her lecture is Demosthenes' Oration on the Crown, which was the classic um, sort of oratory text that people um, gave. Uh, obviously, lots of, um, of sort of American male political leaders are like, this is the greatest speech ever. And she delivers that. Um, uh, that summer actually in with Washington there and the newspapers interpret it as a critique of the Rhode Island delegation for failing to show up. So they sort of take it and spin it um, about the convention, but she's really imagining herself as a model uh, for um, for sort of for sort of the uh, for sort of oratory and she actually says this explicitly um, uh, in correspondence she writes to the newspaper about herself, where she says the example of the female lecturer um, will show that American women are deserting the toilet and the parlor. And that's the sort of in, in private rooms and the semi-private rooms uh, for the college and the forum. And, and that's a pretty incredible claim um, to really say higher education, same kind of education as men, and then political participation. That, that you've hit exactly on uh, the theme I wanted also to expand on, and that is how important education uh, is in this whole um, uh, unfolding uh, of, of what she's done for, for uh, in, in the history of our country. And focusing attention on education is, is a, a very important first step, uh, uh, you know, in our our evolution, I would say. Yeah, I mean, one of the things the book really tries to do, so there's a couple, you know, sort of bigger things the book tries to do in an interesting way is, is sometimes um, women's history is sort of, uh, particularly because of the dominance of sort of ideas of the Republican mother is sort of pushed off to the side, like it doesn't belong to mainstream American stories about politics and government. And this book really tries to argue no, it does, like in a really important way, it's, it's, it's you can't not understand this as part of um, uh, who participates in a constitutional state. Um, and, and then a, a sort of second piece of that is it really tries to place why did people think education was so important? And how education becomes part of what we think of our, uh, parts of constitutionalism or constitutional politics. Mm -hmm. And here we really see in the 1770s and 1780s, um, the argument that, and, and then it will become twisted later on to suggest, well, if you don't have an education, you shouldn't participate. But that's not the argument people are making here. The, argument people are making is to the degree you might think people can't participate, that's because you've excluded them from education. Right. And so if we give people education, then we will ever everyone will be able to participate and to understand the um, political ambition in education is I think so significant in this period and it really does explain how um, you know this is the period of enormous expansion of public education um, in all sorts of ways the um, the you know Congress will actually imagine a national university in this period um, you know there's sort of all sorts of ideas about uh, the the sort of value of education for the constitutional state. Well, it's one of those living examples of, of uh, that, that suddenly the light goes on uh, you know, and, and those who are framing that women can do this, uh, obviously, and, and, and should be uh, encouraged to do it and allowed to do it, if you will. And uh, I mean, at that time, um, we take that for granted in some ways now and in other ways we're still evolving i suppose but uh that struck me as the the, the power of what she was doing at the time do you think yeah. do you think do you think she realized that was she um uh coming at it in that way rather than flame throwing, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's such an interesting question of sort of like, you know, where you're writing about someone where you only have five letters, um, the <laughs> the interior sort of the capacity to to uh, to think about what the interior mind is thinking, we have to be a little bit yeah. 
you know, speculative. But one thing that's interesting is, um, and she was very sophisticated because she had to make money. So she has to sell lecture tickets uh, and she has to persuade people to attend her schools um, because she is the primary breadwinner for their family. She represents um, a, a good reminder of how many women in this period actually do, uh, do work. Obviously that's true of African-American women in this period um, and particularly people like um, Eliza Harriet who are the, the primary bread earners. But I, I think she's quite conscious of it because her advertisements always sort of tilt in both directions. They always contain language that can be read as um, uh, sort of aspirational if what you wanted was your daughter to be considered a lady in some kind of uh, genteel, we, we might think of social status way. And then she also uses language and um, types of readings that would have telegraphed to people who were interested this kind of ambitious understanding of what women were capable of. But she's, she's as a person who needs to make sure she's got people through the door, she's always very careful um, in advertising to sort of to sort of speak to a, um, a sort of complicated audience, uh, and and she does that actually even it, through the lens of, um, uh, of of sex and gender in her tickets. She has a wonderful uh, second set of lectures that she never gives. Um, uh, on the on the human mind, that's her, the faculties of the human mind, and and she doesn't seem to ever give those, but she advertises that her tickets will work for three women or um, two women and one man. So she's advertising a female audience. I was always like, what, were, what was she going to do? Like knock three men out if they all showed up um, together? But but she's encouraging men to come, but she's also explicitly encouraging no. women to come no. um, to be participants. Fascinating. Are there, uh, did you discover any transcripts of her lectures or notes uh, where you ha had to rely mostly on her advertising, which is an yeah. amazing uh, uh, feat uh, that you were able to yeah, I mean, together. I would, I mean, I would have given anything to have yeah. something, uh, to have something like that. No, we don't have anything uh, like that at all. It's all based, but the whole book is constructed really um, out of her, uh, out of her advertising. But we do have, like, I'll just, I'll read because this is such a, a wonderful set piece. Um, uh, f five years after she gives her lectures, um, a, a young woman, Priscilla Mason, gives a speech at the Young Ladies Academy. And this has become a pretty well-known speech. Um, mm -hmm. It sh actually shows up on the AP US history exam uh, as a mm -hmm. document uh, to explain. And this is a young woman. She's about 15 years old. Uh, she's speaking to a predominantly male um, audience in uh, 1793 in Philadelphia. And she says, you know, supposing now that we possessed all the talent of the orator in the highest perfection, where shall we find a theater for the display of them? The church, the bar, the Senate are shut against us. Who shut them? Man, despotic man, first made us incapable of the duty and forbid us the exercise. Let us by suitable education qualify ourselves for those high departments, they will open before us. And this is 1793 and she's 15 years old. Wow. And in, in front of a large crowd of people, uh, she says it. And that's one of the first texts of um, speeches that we really begin to get of women um, uh, speaking. It's a really wonderful set piece for, I always like to imagine she was 10 years old, dragged along by her mom, heard Eliza Harriet, uh, and, the, and that image stayed uh, stayed with her because one of the things Eliza Harriet um, believes is that the female example uh, is so powerful and it's mm -hmm. powerful to be emulated, to be imitated, but also to be improved on. She actually explicitly said that was the power of the example. You didn't have to be perfect, but people would be, would imitate you, but they would improve on you. And she sees herself in that light. And I always like to think of the young Priscilla Mason um, uh, imitating and improving on Eliza Harriet. This, this is a fascinating discussion and I encourage our audience to uh, send in questions that you might have also. Uh, I have a, a few others that uh, I, could, <laughs> I could go on for some time, but um, a couple. Uh, after we read uh, Female Genius, how uh, do you think we rethink uh, the, what the Constitution means or our approach to it? 
I mean, one of the things that the book does in the later parts of the book, um, particularly because Eliza Harriet's um, uh, life turns kind of sad uh, at at the end, um, is her life turns out to map pretty pretty perfectly onto what happens to um, this model of possibly open voting uh, constitutions as they begin to be understood as uh, as very powerful sort of this new genre, very powerful uh, written um, instruments as judiciaries begin to think about interpreting them uh, in all sorts of ways, um, constitutions become ways to exclude people from power. And we can we can see this, the book goes through this, um, but a lot of other historians have written about this, how, how really um, in some ways beginning in the 1790s, but particularly uh, in the 19th century, we see constitutions now beginning to explicitly exclude voters who are not usually the language becomes by the 19th century, uh, white male citizens. And so I think one of the things the book really helps us um, think about is, is what's our understanding of the framing period uh, and, and understanding that some of the things that we link to the framing period might have been there in terms of power, but they weren't yet settled or explicit. Uh, and, and, I, and I think this is a really one of the things I, I wrote a piece recently um, for Fordham Law Review on four um, representatives of Native nations who come to Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, shake hands with George Washington uh, in a very public way, and how we can how we can re understand. Um, the federal government's relationship to Native nations by understanding these people and and pressures outside of the outside of the inside room so um so for me that's a big part of um uh, the book both both understanding a sort of different history of um uh, of inclusion and suffrage and also beginning to understand how important it is to look outside the room to all to so many people uh in this period uh, who had ideas about what the new system ought to look like i think that's a that's a great way to phrase it and some of the uh you know some of the literature I've re read about Native nations approaching uh, the our uh, the government at that time was learning about the education of the Native uh, Americans who were uh, you know going to petition the government. It's a it's a remarkable story that's under uh, undercover. I'm afraid, and I'm so glad for. Professors and others like you are uh, uncovering it. And, yeah, no, uh, there's wonderful work that that has been done and is being done by people uh, really, really expanding our understanding of um, uh, what what that space would have uh, looked like. And I and I think that's an interesting way of thinking about um, the framing generation. Is it's a it's a it's a group of people in a particular moment of time, not you know. I always joke to my legal history class, like it's not fewer people than are in this room today stuck inside a room. And and those those depictions of who's inside the room are so powerful. They're obviously at the National Archives, uh, they're at Congress. And it's not that they're not important, they are important, but um, but those aren't the only people in in the space. They're not the only people with ideas, they're not the only people who are who are putting pressures in all sorts of mm -hmm. interesting ways on um on how the system of government uh, as a government is going to expand. Fascinating story. Are there uh, assumptions about marriage, family, children, the way women function in American society at the time that readers will find uh, challenged as they learn more about Eliza and her work? Yeah, well, for, first of all, um, you know, it's a little bit sad. I mean, I think her husband, I try, you know, I don't know everything about their relationship, but, um, but, but he's a very ambitious, but relatively unsuccessful person. And she's caught in a world where women, uh, because of coverture, married women uh, can't control their own income. She has a little of that because of a trust from her father. But so she reminds us um, of the, the struggle for women, particularly white married women uh, in a world um, uh, prior to the married women's property laws in the mid and late 19th century, uh, where women really just didn't weren't able to own property in their uh, in their own right. And then I, th I think very importantly, the book um, reinterprets uh, sort of within um, a, a long work of uh, sort of women's history, a very powerful idea about why women should be uh, educated that was um, 
pushed by Benjamin Rush. And Benjamin Rush, you know, is a he's anti-slavery. He's very progressive. Um, uh, he's very interested in what should Americans do. And so he writes in the summer of 1787 a very important pamphlet on female education. And that has actually come to be a central text in how we understand uh, women being educated in this period. And Rush argued basically that women should be educated um, to be um, mothers and wives uh, of American citizens. And that's sort of how he understands it. that's an idea that becomes characterized by the term Republican motherhood. And so it gives women a role, but a role that's a very domesticated um, role. And the book, um, the book shows how uh, he's responding to Eliza Harriet. He's trying to drive her out of business, actually, uh, that summer. And that very famous pamphlet is actually directed at her and the kind of education that um, uh, that she was sponsoring. And and to call, you know, she's she's not Irish herself. Uh, she's born to British parents in Lisbon, Portugal, but her husband's Irish Catholic uh, with a very Irish name, O'Connor. And um, but Washington even gets it wrong. He calls her O'Connell. Uh, he can't quite remember the um, the Irish name, which is a little bit surprising because Washington actually had pretty extensive relations uh, with um, Irish immigrants and Irish Americans. But um, but Rush <laughs> Rush was not a fan, and. Um, and the ending, which is often seen as a good thing of a wife and daughter of an American citizen, one, one can hear, you know, uh, someone like me would hear in that um, as a sort of nativist anti-Irish argument. Her husband goes on to write a publicity pamphlet um, for, for Washington, basically, around Georgetown. And he describes himself as a citizen of America. And so I always wonder if there was a little bit like, you know, and John O'Connor's like, yeah. okay, I might not get to be an American citizen yet, but I will describe myself as a citizen of America, uh, of this ambitious idea. Well, I I'm, thank you so much for this. I'm going to turn to some questions from uh, our audience and then um, wrap up with another question. Uh, uh, is there any evidence that Abigail Adams was aware of Eliza Harriet? Oh, I would, if, you know, if, if you can think of people who you would have loved uh, <laughs> to have put in a room together, um, Eliza Harriet and uh, <laughs> Abigail Adams would be, um, uh, would be two of those people. I just was speaking at the Massachusetts Historical Society and, um, and they were saying, people from the Adams papers were saying, you know, she would have loved, she would have loved this. Um, uh, no, no evidence, no evidence at all. And Eliza Harriet uh, actually moves progressively southward. It's one of the things mm -hmm. that's um, uh, something that we really have to struggle with is, is the ways in which her her educational model turns out to to be more successful for her in an enslaved economy. Um, and so she doesn't go north um, uh, uh, towards Boston. At the time, of course, um, the Adamses are uh, in England, they will come back, you know, I mean, not Ab John Abs is in England. And so they don't, um, uh, they don't, they don't get to touch, but it would be a wonderful, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and obviously the very famous um, Abigail Adams's letter um, uh, about remember the ladies is so important in, mm -hmm. you know, in sort of showing us how other women are beginning to think about it. Oh, yeah. Another question, which of her ideas continue to have impact beyond her death. I think you've described uh, some of that already, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I think the model of um, uh, education, uh, and she does things, uh, for example, um, borrowing from Irish educational models, where she has the girls read out loud um, and uh, give public examinations at the end, which was a way of showing examples. That model uh, in 1786 in New York is very rapidly copied. You could have figured that out from other places, but she may be um, uh, she may be the progenitor of that model uh, in the United States. Her her model of female speaking will be um, true of uh, younger women's academies, but it will be a while before there's, you know, you really have to move towards the uh, 19th century before you get uh, a generation of really incredible um, female uh, orators, Anna Clark, um, uh, Maria Stewart, Frances Wright, you know, it'll be a little bit later for, so, so she's, she's, she doesn't quite get the kind of um, influence around uh, female female speaking that we might hope. Mm. 
another question from our audience. Do you have any favorite anecdotes about Eliza Harriet that may not have made it in the book or some that did? Oh, well, <laughs> I think my favorite anecdote about her, you know, when you, but I, there is no portrait of her. There's two lovely pictures in the book of her uncle uh, and cousin, but so I couldn't, you, know, you don't have a sense of her uh, from portraits and, and there's only these few letters uh, from Washington, but those letters date from when she uh, is in Alexandria and she, uh, her husband's taking off for Edenton and she's going to have to shut down her school. And so she writes Washington asking if um, she could come visit to talk, to get advice from him uh, and Martha Washington. And so Washington says, sure, she can come visit uh, Mount Vernon. And then having invited herself, she basically says, well, unfortunately, I don't have a carriage. And so Washington then has to write, OK, I'll send the carriage for you. And, you know, Washington was a pretty intimidating person. He was a very formal person. Um, and the, the kind of 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 self-confidence, I mean, she was respectful, but she did not think she was an inferior to George Washington. And to get Washington to 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 invite yourself, stay for five days and get your the carriage sent for you is, I think, a pretty tells us something about um, the power of her own uh, self-confidence. So, uh... <laughs> Um, last question, and then I want to thank you uh, so much for your time today. And, th and that is, what's next? What's next for you? You, you, uh, you? You've touched on a lot of important topics in your career, and uh, what are you thinking about down the road? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I feel like I remember as a as a very young you know young professor, I was like, I'm never going to write on the Constitutional Convention. You know, I'm going to stay away from that. And now I find myself um, uh, very much in the Constitutional Convention. And the well, it's remarkable that, that you, you you're finding new things about it. I mean, yeah. that's, it's got to be uh, encouraging. And it's as I said at the outset, we're all grateful that you're that you're doing it. Well, there's so many. You know, in a funny way, we've looked so traditionally at the convention that um, that. And one of the wonderful things about so many resources we can now reach um, digitally is that in the old days, you know, one would have had to spend weeks tr tracking up and down the United States looking for stuff. Uh, and, and now you can do it, you know, from the comfort of your uh, uh, computer. Still, you have to go because not everything is there. Um, what I'm really interested in now is um, one of the things that Washington uh, does that summer when he's in Philadelphia is he goes and revisits the um, uh, the sites of the revolution, uh, particularly Valley Forge and several sites that were part of the Philadelphia campaign. And in that sense, we sometimes forget that the summer of 1787 was uh, the 10th anniversary of you know, sort of one of the lowest parts of the American Revolution. Um, it's when uh, they lost Philadelphia and Washington has to go to Valley Forge. And it's really, a, um, uh, you know, it's a moment where he makes uh, some military mistakes. Um, he's he's very vulnerable from people uh, in the military. People aren't at all convinced he's the right person for the job. And the country really looks like, you know, could completely collapse. And so I'm really interested in thinking about um, how, how might Washington's own sense of the anniversary looking backwards towards 1787, mm -hmm. uh, and then his sense of what the new nation might possibly look like, um, uh, how those two sort of stories uh, uh, come together. And very importantly, on a lot of these trips, he's accompanied by uh, William Lee, uh, the enslaved man who uh, will be um, really sort of Washington's right-hand man for most of his life. And so that reminds us of the sort of presence of um, in slavery, slavery and enslavement um, in that sort of story looking back and, and going forward. So I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that, but, um, but I I've been learning to read a lot of military maps about various <laughs> battles, which has been a, a, something really new and fun for me. So, well, keep going. We, uh, we we appreciate your your great work, and I want to thank you very much, Professor Builder, for uh, your fascinating presentation today, the the work you're doing, and illuminating uh, something near and dear to our hearts here and uh, at the Supreme Court Historical Society. And I want to thank uh, also our partners in this in these undertakings. We uh, have partnered recently with um, the Judicial Learning Federal Judicial Learning Centers, which uh, I, I worked on and helped uh, create when I, in my 
prior positions, um, but we have a, a great one in the, the Justice Kennedy uh, Learning Center and at the federal courthouse in Sacramento and Chief Judge Kim Mueller there is, is really uh, working hard to, on programs like this to help educate um, the, the public about our constitutional system. And uh, also we've partnered uh, with the Judicial Learning Center in St. Louis and uh, Judge Rod Sippel uh, has been so very helpful uh, to us along the ways and we're grateful for their participation. Uh, I want to remind our viewers that copies of Female Genius, I'm gonna hold it up here and uh, advertise it shamelessly. Uh, they're available in their society's gift shop at www.supremecourtgifts.org. And uh, I also want to remind everyone our next virtual program is the Society's Law Day celebration on Wednesday, May 4th at noon. That would be Eastern time. So it'll be back to breakfast uh, on the West Coast. Uh, join us. Professor Jonathan Lurie will be speaking on Chief Justice William Howard Taft and the Judicial Conference, a centennial retrospective. It's the 100th anniversary of the Judicial Conference, an important um, marker in our history. Registration is available at the Society's website, again, at www.supremecourthistory.org. Another reminder that a survey will go out later this afternoon to everyone who is registered in advance. And we really hope you will respond. We do wanna make these programs as rich and accessible to as many people as possible. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you again, Professor Builder, for this fascinating discussion and a very interesting read. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>